everybody and welcome back um, from your break. I would now like to introduce Matthias Lippers, Research Data Specialist Informatics at the Australian Research Data Commons. And Matthias's presentation is entitled, It's a Pid, 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 Pid World. Take it away, Matthias. Thanks, Catherine. Let me adjust, put my slides up on screen so there are some nice pictures to go on with what I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Now, I know that sounds a bit strange given I'm on the committee, but I did have nothing to do with the decision process to let me speak. Uh, no conflict of interest. Well, there was a conflict of interest, but anyway. Um, so Kaya Nonokot and Kiora Koto Katoa. Um, I would like to start my presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are here today. Uh, and I yeah, invite you to acknowledge your traditional, local traditional owners in the chat. Now, I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons, uh, which I think many people in this audience have heard of before. I mean, not to mention that Tom, my colleague, spoke in the last session. Uh, but as a quick recap, the ARDC is here to provide researchers with a competitive advantage through data. Um, and um, we do that by uh, working on a lot of different things. Look, one of the most noticeable things is the large investments we make into projects to make their data more open, more shareable. But we also work in a lot of other areas um, ab about building connections between research data, between research tools, research platforms, and, and so on. And one of the things that is, uh, or rather a collection of things that are absolutely vital to the connection of research objects to each other are PIDs, persistent identifiers. Now, um, I use the term PID every day, several times a day. It's literally my job. Um, but I, and, and hopefully you're all familiar with at least one PID. Um, so, but I'll first quickly go through some of the things that PIDs are. Um, before then going into the different kinds of PIDs that the ARDC is currently actively working on to uh, improve and ease their uptake here in Australia. So PIDs are persistent identifiers, are globally unique strings of characters. And when I say globally unique, I mean that when a PID exists, it is never duplicated, never copied to refer to something else. So. Uh, it is it, it globally unique and it identifies a research object of some kind. Uh, it is persistent, as I said, and that means that they're here for the long haul uh, and it'll take some kind of uh, global catastrophe to make the, the national, sorry, international PID infrastructure fall over. So the DOIs that you have now will keep working unless something really, really bad happens. Um, and the final feature of a PID is that it is resolvable to something. So you can have a PID and you, uh, if the PID is in the form of a URL, you can visit that URL or you can send, give that PID to a resolver and you will then be directed to the exact object that that PID refers to. So the PID that hopefully most people uh, will recognize is the DOI, the Digital Object Identifier. And that was, uh, that was first created over 20 years ago, so about 2000. Um, and DOIs were originally used to refer to research publications, journal articles, largely. Uh, since then, DOIs have uh, been expanded to refer to research data sets and a few other things more recently that I'll go into later. So what are PIDs good for? Um, and the idea is that a PID helps um, with the identification, the citation, and the linking of research. So the most common example would be, you have a research article, that article has its own DOI, but when you look at the reference list for that research article, it then has the DOIs for all of the other articles that have been cited in that particular article. So by taking all of those DOIs, you can actually build a network of how papers relate to each other. And with the addition of more persistent identifiers to refer to different things, not just research papers, 
we can build a network and build these connections of how people relate to papers, relate to data, relate to organizations, relate to instruments, uh, relate to the samples. So the rocks they're digging out of the ground and everything uh, will be identifiable, uniquely identifiable by a persistent identifier of some kind. So what do we have so far? Um, now this is um, only very, very, very slightly out of date, uh, I think. In fact, you know what, I think, you can still consider this current. The biggest issue with PIDs at the moment is that it is a very rapidly moving landscape. And so a persistent identifier that you might have started using a couple of years ago might not be there anymore, which flies in the face of what I just said, I suppose. So they're not actually persistent in that regard. Um, but the, uh, th there was a lot of excitement um, about PIDs. And so uh, organizations started to spin up PIDs for all sorts of different things. But what we're finding now is that there's a bit of leveling out, things are maturing, things are settling down. And so uh, the PID that you might buy into today, there is a much, much higher chance that that PID will continue to work. But if it does, cease to work, then it will be migrated gracefully into some other kind of system. And, and we've got a, I've got an example of that coming up. So uh, we've got uh, here uh, DOIs for research outputs. So traditionally research um, articles, but increasingly data software, which uh, my colleague Tom spoke about earlier. Uh, we're starting to apply DOIs to instruments. So a microscope or a drone or something else used in research to analyze something and generate some data. You might also be familiar with the ORCID for, um, and, and the ORCID is useful for uniquely identifying people. We are starting to see the uh, adoption of ROR, R-O-R IDs for the recognition of organizations, which includes research funders. Um, and then there is also the RAID, uh, which I'll go into more detail later. Um, but within projects, we have samples identified by IGS, lots of different identifiers. So um, the ARDC has a PID roadmap um, that I have the honor of uh, leading at the moment. So I just started this role late last year. Um, and on our roadmap, we are considering a lot of the different persistent identifiers that we think are worthwhile investing in. And we are making investments in those persistent identifiers and making it easier for Australian research organizations to take those PIDs and integrate them into their systems. Um, now DOIs, um, you, uh, I've said already, research papers, data sets, software. So uh, the data site DOI is, um, is, is a DOI that is being increasingly adapted to lots of different other kinds of research outputs. So you could these days apply a data site DOI to software images, a computational notebook like a Jupyter notebook, gray literature. So librarians will know that is you know, reports that uh, and, and papers and literature that haven't been formally published, data management plans, samples and physical objects is a new one. Uh, and the instruments is also quite new as well. The ARDC is the Australian lead for, uh, or rather is the lead of an Australian consortium. Um, and so if you are interested in, uh, or your organization is interested in integrating DOI minting into its services, you might have a data repository or a, um, or, or a sample management system uh, or, or an instrument database, and you'd like to integrate PIDs DOIs into that system, and come and talk to us. Now, our consortium is largely for sort of smaller scale DOI minting organizations, uh, and, and we will more than welcome you into the fold. Um, however, data site would like the larger organizations or rather the organizations that mint more DOIs, and I'm, I'm talking about you know, four or five figures a year to talk to data site directly, but in the first instance, absolutely come and talk to us at the ARDC. Uh, ORCID. Now, uh, the, the uh, open researcher and contributor identifier, uh, ORCID, it's uh, completely free to get. Um, any researcher, or to be honest, any human can get themselves an ORCID and start using that ORCID to uh, link 
their various works together. So here are some works that I wrote a few years ago um, and, and they all appear on my ORCID profile. So there are links between my ORCID and these works. And if I were to say, uh, start work at a new institution, uh, well, I know I just started this job, I don't intend to move on anytime soon. If I start working at a new institution, I can give them my ORCID and they can pull in all of my previous body of work or anything that I've put into my ORCID ID. Now the ARDC is not leading work on uh, ORCID here in Australia, but we do uh, support the AAF, the Australian Access Federation, who is the lead agency in Australia. Um, and, and we completely support everything that they do. Next up, uh, some big news. The IGSN, the International Geo Sample Number, um, is but it's, it's not dead, um, that's probably not quite so accurate, but the international geo sample number is changing form. So uh, what has happened, uh, what happened last year essentially is that IGSN, the organization behind IGSN and Datasite have agreed to, to bring IGSN into the Datasite DOI fold. And at the same time, there's gonna be a little bit of rebranding happening. And so the international geo sample number is going to become at this stage, quite likely not officially confirmed, going to be the international general sample number. So the IGSN was born quite a few years ago and it was uh, created by largely geologists, geochemists, who wanted a way to uniquely identify the physical mineral samples they were collecting out in the field. Um, of course, there are other kinds of samples and specimens in research. Uh, we have uh, biological samples, so maybe a nice fern, uh, artifacts uh, in, in archeology, span um, lots of different physical items that are very, very important to research. Not everything is digital these days. Um, now, I realize I'm possibly running out of time, so I better wrap up. Uh, so uh, the ARDC heavily involved in IGSN, and I will be more than happy to give you any further information about the process that will take place over this year of IGSNs rolling into DOIs. Uh, instruments is another big area as well. Uh, so there is an international group um, that has been working on standards and recommendations about applying identifiers to instruments. And at this stage, it looks like the data site DOI is the, the PID of choice for an instrument. Now, the thing is with an instrument, it can be reconfigured and changed and has different behaviors and different performances. And that's really important to research reproducibility. So what we're doing alongside applying DOIs to instruments is minting handles or creating handle identifiers for the configurations of those instruments. So when you combine the DOI with the handle, you then have clear information about not only what the instrument was, but exactly how it was configured or calibrated at the time of a particular analysis or for a particular research project. And um, instruments then very closely tied to facilities, research organizations, uh, and the ARDC will be working, I just had a meeting with them this morning, will be working with the International Research Organization Registry to uh, try and bulk up the list of Australian facilities and organizations that are represented in RAW. And then very, very finally, uh, I promise, um, the ARDC is leading work in developing the research activity identifier, RAID, um, RAID has been identified as the missing link. So, so far we've had, uh, we've had papers, data, software, grants, instruments, people, organizations, but the actual activity of research itself, the envelope you need to stuff everything else into hasn't existed. So we uh, developed RAID uh, over the past couple of years, and now we are putting in many more resources to uh, really scale it up and make it sustainable in the long term. So that's it from me. Very quick whirlwind discussion in 14 minutes. Very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. We've had quite a few questions come into the Padlet. So I'll start working through those. Um, from Stephen C, we've got one. It seems like there's a PID for everything. That's a ton of PIDs. Is there such a thing as too many PIDs or PID overload, or is there effectively infinite capacity? 
Um, well, look, I mean, it's uh, there's always an XKCD comic to, to describe the situation. I know of the one now, but I won't be able to bring it up. But um, yes, there are, there are PIDs for lots of different things. And uh, I certainly had PID overload before I started specifically, you know, spending all of my work time in this space. But the good news is that there are organisations like the ARDC to help you, people who do not, who cannot spend all of their time thinking about PIDs, we can do that thinking for you. We can help you out. So uh, if you want to know anything about any kind of PID, get in touch and I'm more than happy to have a chat with you about it. I'm in Perth. So if you're in Perth as well, we could even have a coffee. Cool. <laughs> okay. The next question is, have you come across any novel ways of helping researchers or librarians expand their knowledge of PIDs, such as the OA escape room or similar, i.e. how would you recommend we upskill researchers on this topic? I, um, well, I, ha I have a bit of a controversial um, uh, thought on topics like this. And what I would actually rather do, rather than making something fun or novel, is I would rather make it easy and barrier free. So what I want to see is a lot of effort being put into integrating these identifiers into systems so that it is easier for a researcher or, or a research support professional to use the PID than it is to not use it. So, um, I mean, for example, you, I don't like it when people have to type a PID in. That's awful. That's because, I mean, I make typos all the time. And imagine if you make a typo in your orchid and, and everything goes awry. So at the moment, uh, lots of research institutions have uh, integrated orchid into, um, uh, let's say, symplectic element. You can connect with your orchid. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how well the integration works, but in best case scenario, you can make a call to the orchid site and the orchid site says, hey, do you give permission for elements to pull data from me? And I say, yep, sure. And then elements will automatically grab data from Orchid for you and you don't need to do anything more. And I want to see that kind of integration happening so that, to be honest, researchers don't even necessarily realise that they're using persistent identifiers because it all happens seamlessly without them knowing it's happening. That sounds great. Good plan. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question is, what's the difference between a data site DOI or a cross-ref one? Is it the that, jurisdiction? Uh, yes, uh, that's, that's a fantastic question. And you've hit the nail on the head there, Catherine. So um, cross-ref DOIs existed first. Here's a crash history course. Cross-ref DOIs existed first. But they were very much focused on minting DOIs only for publications and things that have been formally published. Um, and some researchers didn't like that. They wanted to be able to mint identifiers, DOIs for data sets. So they created DataCite. DataCite has since expanded to mint, mint DOIs for more than just data sets, for all sorts of software instruments, what have you. Crossref has since expanded also into uniquely identifying grants. So when the ARC or the NH and MRC uh, apply a grant, you could get a DOI for that grant. So they are different jurisdictions. What is it that you want to mint the DOI for? And then that's the organisation that you need to talk to. Okay, that makes sense. Um, all right, next question. What are some instances a RAID would be, would be used? Okay. So um, a, a RAID describes a research activity, a, a research project. And... Uh, and look, there are oftentimes a research project is, isn't, there's not a direct one-to-one -one mapping with a grant, for example. So a single project might involve several grants from several organizations. So you could combine all those grants together with that, with that RAID. So it's easier to manage that information flow. Um, and, and then a very good example of that is, what if the principal investigator moves to a different organisation, moves, um, say they, they move from one university to another, they decide to move across the country. Use, if a RAID has been applied to their project and, and implemented nicely, then it would be much easier for the destination university's research management system to go, all right, we've got this researcher coming in, that's their orchid. We've got these raids associated with that orchid. And now we know all about the different projects that are being brought into the university. 
Okay. All right, that's where at time. There's a couple of other questions in the paddle that I didn't get to, but you can answer those afterwards. But yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. I will call you Pig Guy now. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um...